What do you know, folks? We are back inside Black and Gold. Steve Geller and Jeff Nowak, happy to be with you. It seems like it's been a lot longer than it has, though, How's, Jeff. It has been a while, um, and I don't want to get too- sure. You had the last episode. Yeah, well, no, we did one episode from my parents' kitchen uh, in Connecticut, oh, that's right. so we did have that. But yeah, it's been a it's been a crazy month. I don't want to get too into it. Uh, I do want to thank Steve for helping me out while I was. Uh, indisposed over the last month that i haven't tweeted in like a week and a half i'm trying to hey. figure out how to how to make my return to twitter but it's kind of been nice i've kind of been enjoying it like someone tweeted at me yesterday and i like instead of arguing with them i texted other people and and complained about them to other people uh and i was just like you know what this is a better way to handle this this does, this doesn't need to be my return to twitter is arguing whether like because they got mad at me because i used the term like lsu bullied another opponent and they were like, you're just, you're part of the problem. And I was like, being called the bully of the NCAA tournament is like the highest praise you can receive. <laughs> that's not the issue we've been dealing with. Uh, anyway, uh, that's. Can, that can you imagine the bad boy Pistons in, in this day and age of Twitter? Forget it. It's just funny because it's like people want to hinge on like words and it's like words matter, but it's also the intent behind those words that matter. And you're, you're, you're just like, you're missing the point. You're missing the forest for the trees here. Like, guys, like the fact that words mean different things in context of sports. Anyway, that's uh, we're not here to talk about LSU, although we can talk about UConn if you want, because they're in both <laughs> Final Fours, baby. Um, dominating. Dominating on the hardwood like usual with UConn. Yeah, well, I, I was actually able to go to the Big East uh, championship game while I was in uh, in Connecticut, so that was kind of cool. It was at Madison Square Garden. Um, I think I told you that, actually, on the yeah. last episode. Um, but yeah, so I'm I'm back. Should be back in a normal schedule here. It's been a tough month, but you know I'll uh, I'll get through it. Um, so because of that, because we haven't had an episode last week, and a lot actually happened for the off season. A lot happened last week in terms of got a lot of interviews, a couple signings. You know they brought back Jonathan Abram, Ugo Amadi, and we're not going to get too much into that, but it's just information that you can have. Uh, and we'll figure that out. So we're going to go through a rundown of like all the stuff that's happened. We're going to hit it quickly in this first segment because there's a, there's a lot of stuff that I want to talk about in short, but we don't need to necessarily go over at length. Right. Um, stuff that we've talked about previously, Chase Young, for example, that I want to give talk a little bit more about the recent developments without going into everything. So we'll do that. Second segment, um, I want to talk about Charlie uh, Smith. I keep on calling him Charlie Murphy. When I first saw the name, too, and saw he's an Irish lad, I was like, is it Smith or Smythe? But it is Smith. It is Smith, although it is spelled with a Y. Right. So if there was an E on the end, it would be Smythe. Um, but, yeah, Charlie Smith, uh, he talked for 27 minutes <laughs> in, his, in his introductory press conference, which... Uh, no media I, had a ton of questions for the Irish kicker. Uh, well, that's the funny thing. It's kind of like when Darren Rizzi talks, because... It's not that they asked a ton of questions. It's that every answer was like six minutes long. And that's the same thing Darren Rizzi does. So I think we've, I, I, I think that's probably like part of why they, they were, you know, drawn to each other is they both like to talk. Anyway, so we'll talk about that. I also want to kind of tie that into the new kickoff rule because I think that's going to be a significant change that I think people might be underestimating um, and, and what impact it's going to have. So I want to get into that. The final segment, we're going to talk about the biggest thing the Saints have left to address this offseason. They've, They've checked a good, a good number of boxes, but there are some left with big question marks in them. So we're going to go through all that. But first things first, we had Dennis Allen at the owners' meetings. You know, Mickey Loomis also talked. Dennis Lausha also talked. We got both Dennis's. Dennis Lausha talked about Super Bowl, you know, stuff like that, getting ready. We're not going to get into a ton of that. But uh, one thing he did talk about and has been put out. So we can start with that. Saints are going to Irvine. We, we knew this. This is not news in terms of that information, but they did confirm it. And one thing Dennis Lush had talked about was like, <laughs> if you're questioning why they're leaving, uh, go drive down airline and just take a gander over at the level of construction that's going on. And uh, you'll, you'll understand why moving through this off season was kind of a necessity because <laughs> it's, it's all blown up, you know, it, and you think about it, it's like, there's so many people at that facility during training camp, having that going on, like it, it, it might not have a massive impact, but it will have some level of impact. And you don't want to be looking at this team in September being like, man, we didn't get as much work done because this was in pain in the ass. This was a problem. 
you know, it's, you know what I'm saying? Like, so if there was any question whatsoever, they're going to, they're going to err on the side of like, let's go hang out in California for a month. Right. It's funny because right now too, I feel like a ton of people have latched onto the story and are like saints undergoing renovations, heading out West because of being forced to renovate cafeteria due to F in player grades. Yeah. The, like it, that's the, it's the type of like lazy <laughs> reporting that, that you'll see on like outkick. Right. Uh, you know, the people who are like complaining about LSU not being out for the anthem when they haven't gone been on the court for a national anthem all season. Like that's what we're talking about, right? That's the type of reporting you'll get. But it, the, Dennis talked about that too, Dennis Lapsh. He was like, guys, I need you to understand this was a long time coming. We were planning to do this long before the cafeteria got an F. <laughs> like we didn't make this decision. Like I had heard Irvine as a location. We were talking about this last off season. Yeah, like <laughs> we were asking D- DA about it. it was like, oh, you want to go back to like Lacrosse, Wisconsin, or whatever. Anyway, so Saints are out of town. I, we haven't gotten the dates yet. It's going to be interesting to see how they manage it and how they make an effort to establish fan engagement. I imagine they will do something that is more than just like a draft party or whatever. But that's something we can kind of uh, broach at a later time. We did get some dates though on uh, OTAs and minicamp. Yeah, what are those? Do you know? Uh, I'd have to search my stuff real quick here. Let me check. All right. While you're doing that, um, (laughs) we're going to move on to uh, Chase Young. And so the last episode, we talked a lot about Chase Young and and the impact we expect him to have and and why it made sense for the Saints to go after him. Since that time, there's been some news coming out. It's it's kind of it's on the older side, so we don't have to take too long on it. But the first thing is that the fully guaranteed contract is not really fully guaranteed. And I think that's significant in a, in a couple ways. One, because the terminology fully guaranteed, I think is a little confusing to people because it's not necessarily fully guaranteed in the sense that no matter what happens, he's getting all that money. It's fully guaranteed in the sense that the saints are unable to cut him and save money. So by that, I mean, so it's a $13 million one-year contract with the cap hit spread out. I think his cap hit for this year is going to be in the range of two and a half, three million, whatever. Um, But the rest of that money, or at least the majority of that money is tied to workout incentives and game day incentives. So he can earn about 8 million of that contract through being available to play. I think it's something like 400 grand or, hold on, uh, I have it. Yeah, and real, real quick, uh, Saints rookie minicamp, May 10th. Uh, then OTAs begin on May 21st. And June 11th is mandatory minicamp. There you go. And yeah, normal, these dates are usually around the yeah. same. We could probably guess at them every year. But uh, yeah, so $470,000 per game bonus. So every game he's active, he gets that $470,000 bonus. So there's as long as he's active, he gets that money. That's why it's quote unquote guaranteed um, because they're, they're likely to be earned assuming he's healthy. But if he's not, and we're going to talk about the neck surgery here in a second, if he's not, the Saints can recoup that money against next year's salary cap. That's kind of how it works because you have to tie up that money this year to, to account for that because it's guaranteed, but say he misses five games and you're able to save, what would that be about two, 2 million against the cap next year? That's how it would work. You would kind of credit it toward that. Um, and that would kind of cut down on that big number that they have to, uh, they have to navigate. But so that's kind of how that works. And the reason that's important is because as we know now, Chase Young has to have neck surgery prior to the start of the season. And which as makes Mickey Lewis- fans melt immediately when hearing that. Yeah, you're gonna hear it. You no, know, but you know, one of the reasons the Saints were able to sign him at all was because of because of this. And it's true. It's an interesting situation because, you know, Chase Young was actually able to use this impending surgery to his own benefit. And and when I say that, I mean he's not expected to miss any time. But this surgery could have happened previously. He wasn't on a team. He was a free agent. So there's no incentive to get it done. I think you'd probably want to allow a team to m- manage this surgery so that they can feel comfortable about how it's how it's done, right? So you don't necessarily want to do it prior to a team getting to look at you and, and, and agreeing with the procedure you're having, right? 
At the same time, the Saints are typically a team that in this situation would say, this is what we want to pay. Go go see if you have any offers on the table. Come back. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't, right? They couldn't do that here because the longer you draw out that contract process, the longer you draw out the time before he has that surgery. And every day you wait is another day on the back end of that timeline that he might not be available. Right. So the Saints, you know, this might be a situation where, hey, yeah, we'll wait it out. Maybe we can get a better deal. No, because if you wait it out a month and a half, right, then that right. just pushes it into training camp. So the Saints actually had a soft deadline of Chase Young's making because if they wanted Chase Young, they had to pony up now. Right. Yeah. So it's actually really interesting because in a situation where his market probably was diminished due to the the injury that he needed to address, which happened in the last preseason. And, you know, I think Dennis Allen said that Chase would tell you that it affected him, but you watch it on film and you do, you wouldn't really know. Like, unless you knew, you wouldn't say, ah, his neck was bothering him there. That's why he wasn't able to get off that block. That's why he didn't execute his move right way. Uh, he would probably say that. So it was bothering him, even if it didn't show up in his play a lot. And so that's where you are. I'm not super concerned about it, because this is just one of those situations. Guys have off-season surgeries all the time, and you never hear about them. Like this is a little bit more significant, and it is happening concurrently with a with a with a contract signing. So we're going to find out about it. But in a lot of cases, guys will have cleanup surgeries after the season that we never learn. Like Cam Jordan had surgery. None of us knew about it until he posted that he was at rehab, right? So you know, it's something that yes, it's concerning anytime someone has to work on his neck, but when you have the contract set up to protect you in the, in, in case it is something that forces him to miss time, that makes me feel a lot better about it. Yeah. And you're, you're, you have a very low risk contract on the books for a guy who could be a potential, you know, game wrecker if you're able to get him on the field and healthy. So I think, I still think it's a great deal, even with the surgery for the saints. Yeah. I was definitely um, I'm not as high on chase young just because of the past issues that he's dealt with injuries and then seeing 13 million guaranteed and he needs yeah. next surgery. I was definitely through the roof, not happy. And then once more, the details came out surrounding his contract with the saints, it was like, Oh, okay. That that's definitely reasonable and not ridiculous. You know, giving up all up all that money up front. Yeah. Right. If it was fully guaranteed and you had no protection whatsoever, he misses all, right. he misses the entire season and doesn't play. It still gets that money. That's a different scenario. Like this, this is the Saints and Chase kind of coming to an accord. You know, they, they also had Tyron Matthew recruiting him, which is interesting uh, because it's like, yeah, okay, he's a player and he's out there selling the... You know, you talk about players being disgruntled and DA said this, you know, one of the reasons they want Tyron to be the guy, he's such a good salesman for the organization, is he's played in other, in other buildings. Like he, he was with the Cardinals, he was with the Texans, he was with the Chiefs, he won a Super Bowl. He's been around the block. He knows how it can be. And, you know, the Chiefs get terrible grades on these report cards, right? That's one of the reasons we're going to talk about Mike Thomas in a bit. Like, I don't know. Like, Mike Mike has some gripes about how the medical staff operates with the Saints. I'm interested to see how he feels about how other teams' medical staffs operate, right? Because what is his frame of reference for complaining about the medical staff? I don't know. But, like, Tyron would know. And so he, that's why I think, like, him being a – ambassador for this team is is actually a very positive thing for this organization when you I was agree? surprised it wasn't Cam Jordan at the dinner I mean I'm sure he and Cam, he and Chase have talked right? oh, definitely right uh I think Cam Cam is more of a guy who might uh who might uh try to be, overpower the conversation a little bit <laughs> you know and, I, like, and I don't know in, down, in talking Cam. to Chase in talking to Chase I never I didn't get the impression that he was like a super like high energy conversation kind of guy. And I don't know if you're trying to match that energy. I'm not sure Cam would be. No, guy. that that is a good match then with Tyron for, for sure. With, with like you said there and yeah, Cam might be too much at the, at the dinner uh, recruiting him. But I, I, I know that obviously uh, Cam's excited about this uh, and should be, we, we've been dying to get some kind of help opposite side of him. That's been consistent. And I mean, we're still we're questioning what's going to happen with a guy like Peyton Turner 
What are we yeah. going to see from, you know, Isaiah Foskey? Uh, Carl Granderson is still, you know, growing into his role. So the, the defensive end position is very interesting for this team. Yeah, I mean, it could be super high end if you get you right. know, <laughs> the returns you'd hope out of Chase Young, Peyton Turner, Isaiah Foskey, and then Carl Granderson, Cam Jordan, like these guys. It could also be a massive problem if you don't. So that's it, it's probably the biggest variable of this offseason is how that defensive end position uh, rolls up. But I, I thought DA's comments on Isaiah Foskey were really interesting. It's something I want to talk about in a later episode of like, you know, maybe some breakout candidates would be that would be a good time to talk about it. So I don't want to get into it now because of what I do want to talk about is the other side of the line. And that's Ryan Ramchick. So, you know, that's another bit of news that came out last week. It's not breaking. This is the first episode we've had. So we're going to go over it. And let's listen to what DA said on Ryan Ramchek um, to kind of jog your memory a little bit. You know, at the Combine a few weeks ago, I was feeling a lot better about it. Um, and yet I don't know that I'm seeing as much progress as I was hoping to see, you know, at this point. So I think that still kind of remains to be seen. But here's the cool thing. We've got plenty of time, you know. No different than what we were talking about with with Cam and being a veteran player and, and uh, probably not utilizing necessarily a lot during during this OTA and, and uh, mini camp. You know, I would see the same thing. You know, with Ram too. So I think we're just going to have to wait and see how that all goes as we go through you know all the off season and, and as we get into the training camp aspects. Is that something that could be a concern maybe going into the season? Yeah. Yeah, I think it could be. But again, like we'll, we'll just have to kind of wait and see. Did you just not respond to that surgery as well as you guys had hoped? Or what kind of what, what caused you to change? I think more more of it's just been visiting with him, and, and, and he just isn't quite where I was probably hoping he'd be. Uh, and, and, and really, quite frankly, where, where he was hoping he'd be. So, But again, there's a long time before we kick the ball off. So I wouldn't jump to any any conclusions right now, but but you know we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes over the next you know three, four, five, six months, whatever that is, before we get to the season. So here's the cool thing: time is a construct, and it lasts as long as it lasts, and there is time before Ryan has to play football. That's the cool thing. And when that's the cool thing is the problem. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's obviously a negative update about Ryan Ramchek, especially yeah. when you consider where things were said to be at the Combine a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, whenever, however long ago it was, uh, where DA gave very positive uh, comments of how he thought Ryan was. So clearly something has changed since that point. Time um, was not cool then. Time it, the 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 uncool thing is that a lot of time has not a lot of time has passed <laughs> since then, but so much has changed in the wrong direction. That's the uncool thing. Um, but no, so I mean, this is the reason we did a mock draft, and even with Da giving that glowing update at the combine, I was still like, I'm getting my right tackle, and that's why I stuck with uh, Talia Sefuanga, who is a very much a right tackle prospect, because. Yeah. While the Saints have a lot of questions at left tackle, and we're going to talk about that later on the episode, um, I'm more concerned with with the fact that you have you could have no tackle, um, and even like you you're still hopeful that a guy like Trevor Penning can can step into that role in year three and maybe and improve, but your your hope for Ryan is that he can be an NFL player for a sustainable amount of time, and I'm I got to start like I'm hoping that. My plan at left tackle is still my old plan at left tackle, if it can be. My new, my plan at right tackle has to be, what is our plan at right tackle? <laughs> Find someone. Uh, and hopefully they can play behind Ryan for a year so that when they step into that role, they'll be ready. Um, but either way, that's, that's you know, what if you thought that, that need, the right tackle question was going to drop down the list of like concerns... You're, 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 it's a rude awakening right there. No, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to whenever we do our next mock because, yeah, I mean, I don't know how you can't have tackle as that extremely pressing need, obviously, at number 14 right off the bat. And, and thankfully, this draft is chock full of those prospects. So uh, you would think one of the top ones should should be available for the 
Saints come the real deal, not just our mock drafts, even though, you know, I'm still seeing Jaden Daniels and Mox going like number 11 ridiculously. Yeah. What's going to drive people nuts is when they go offensive tackle at 14 and 45, or I'm sorry, at 14 and then trade up to get someone else to get another tackle. And I, and I, I would tell you that's like, that might be the smart play. I'm not arguing either, right? Uh, but it would drive people nuts because it's not fun. Like people want to have fun at the draft. They want to go watch highlights. You know, they want to go watch Chris Olave mossing people at Ohio State. Right. When you not- talk about the sexy picks, uh, an offensive lineman sadly is not sexy, even though protecting your quarterback is sexy as hell. It's an imperative. <laughs> it has to happen. So like anyone, I mean, and that's the thing. It's like a very, it's a very uninitiated take to be like, oh man, that's boring. I don't like it. Like, Anyone who watches the NFL regularly knows that those boring picks are usually the good picks. Right. Um, you know, like everyone got excited when the Giants took Saquon Barkley, right? It's like, that's a bad pick. It's fun. <laughs> and it's you get to share all these highlights. And, you know, but it's like, you know how far that set them back when they did that instead of taking a tackle that could protect their court? Anyway, um, so <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Uh, we can we can segue off Ryan because that's really not a huge update on Ryan. It's just still in the same situation. That's really what the update is. Is you're in the same boat you were, but what it what that prompted was another tweet storm from Mike Thomas. Um, and <laughs> who this? Who, yeah, yeah. Old phone. I know you. <laughs> um, and uh, so Mickey was asked about the Mike Thomas situation, and here's you know I think his uh, yeah. I'll just I'll just play it while you have it. Has also uh, moved on from Michael Thomas or back into an end. Yeah, you know, we'll see where that ends up. Uh, could you expand on what you meant by we'll see where that ends up with Thomas? Yeah, that- no. <laughs> what I said was what I said. Okay. Uh, I guess it's like, is that door still open for you guys? Or yeah, is that- again, I, I've already said, I've already commented on that, so I don't want any more comments on it. Mickey, what do you. Well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i uh i guess i understand where mickey's coming from there uh because uh i would have like what is he supposed to say <laughs> um and uh and i i it, it and definitely do, feels like he's the disgruntled ex-employee right now oh I, I, well that's that is the literal definition but he's been he's been like that so it's nothing new i mean yeah that's literally what he is is a disgruntled ex-employee and, you know, you can look at it and say, hey, you know, he's he's got a point. And I think the medical staff of any team is something that you should be looking at every year and being like, OK, is this what we need it to be? Do we need to make changes, adjustments, whatever? Um, so if there's a if there are problems, yeah, like I go fix them. But what I would say is like. Hey, Mike. Don't you have like stuff to do like. Shouldn't you be like going to find a team to play for? Like, why is like, how, like there's, it'll get to a point where this is becoming problematic for your next team. Uh, it, you know, it's like if you, if you, you know, break up with somebody and you start dating someone else and the only thing you talk about is your ex, cool. that's a, it's kind of a red flag for your, for your new relationship. Probably not gonna, probably not gonna flourish, if you will. So yeah, I don't remember know. When, when Mike was balling and he was tweeting out stuff that we all loved, it used to be like hashtag shh. Well, he, he needs to listen to that. Well, right. Like it's like you want to prove him wrong, go prove him wrong. You're not I don't think I don't know. He can keep complaining all he wants. I just don't think that's helping him. It's like there's a there's an Antonio Brown Odell Beckham Jr. paradox that's happening. There's like you know, like Odell Beckham Jr. was in a similar situation. What he did was go to the Rams and win a Super Bowl. And I think that's a pretty good way of shutting people up about like, ah, whatever, you know, he can't stay healthy and, and all this, you know, like Antonio Brown did the same thing, but he did it in a completely different way. And it, and it, <laughs> and it ended with him, everyone being like, this guy's not well. Um, and so I don't know, I, I'd like to see Mike have success somewhere. <laughs> I, the, 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 this whole, like, you know, every, every time something happens with your former team, you go off. I don't know. It's not a good look, but, um, I understand it. I understand the frustration. Mike, his body just won't keep let him stay on the field. Well, we'll see. You know, I I hope maybe he will. I think he's taking steps every year. <laughs> and this year he got through nine games. Maybe next year he gets through 15. Uh, but, you know, I do understand. And, and a lot of his gripe is toward T- DA and Dennis Allen. And that's who he was going at with those tweets. 
in the medical staff, but also like DA, he's just saying he's kind of a puppet, whatever. Um, right. Now, there is part of that that I that I actually I do understand, and I'm going to play this clip, and this clip is also kind of tangentially related to what I want to talk about. This is Dennis Allen talking about Taysom Hill. He was asked, um, you know, if Sean Payton's going to come after Taysom Hill. Uh, Pete, they talk to you about bringing Taysom with them to, to Denver. No, that cop, that uh, conversation has not been broached. I'm sure, look. I feel like Sean's tried to get everybody else from yeah. from the Saints to go to Denver with him. So, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Okay. So w- when I hear crit- so there's a lot of reasons to be critical of Dennis Allen, but like from a strategical perspective and from a defensive perspective, I think he's still done a good job in that regard, right? One of the reasons that I think it's so easy to to heap dirt on DA is when he's asked questions like that, I don't think he takes enough time to be like, how will this be perceived if the person I'm talking about hears this? And especially when you're talking about a guy who, you know, two years ago at the at the Combine, that's how Taysom learned that he's a tight end now. He's not a quarterback anymore, right? right. You've taken that off his off his potential list of like, for a long time, John Payton kept that hope alive, right? He kept that carrot out in front of him, dangling it. And DA took that away. And and maybe that's for the best because I don't think Sean ever really intended of making Taysom Hill the starting quarterback. He made Jameis Winston the starting quarterback. But you do have to appreciate the amount that Taysom has kind of sacrificed and done everything in his role for this team to the point that you should hear that question and be like, no, Taysom's our guy. Sean can come after if he wants, but Taysom's our guy. No, right. that's not what he said. He said, we'll see. And and it's like in a situation like last year, you'd be like, okay, maybe. But this year you're talking about Clint Kubiak bringing in an offense where a, a versatile tight end that can line up everywhere and do a bunch of different stuff. I don't know. That seems like something he probably wants. So I don't know. Like when I complain about DA, and a lot of it is based on that. A lot of it is based on the principles that a head coach has to have and the ability a head coach has to have to maintain, build, uh, you know, foster chemistry in a locker room. It's something that coordinators don't necessarily need. Obviously it helps and that you'll see coordinators get advanced to head coaches and succeed, but you don't need it because you have that coming from the head coach. When you are the head coach, that is something that is part of your job that you have to be able to manage. And that's what I don't think DA always gets. And you see it like you see like what what you think Mike Thomas was like he is now the entire season. No, it builds. It builds. Right. It's something that head a head coach who wants to be a head coach for a long time has to kind of inherently understand and manage. It's like you look at you'll see coaches get a job and like have some early success and then things fall off a cliff. Ben McAdoo with the Giants. Look at Nick Sirianni. Right. He's he's on the wrong end of that right now. His team quit on him. You know, and and the ability to build that culture over time is that subtle thing that you don't really talk about in coaching hires, but it's usually what determines who's there for 10 years and who's there for three. Um, and it's something that Sean understood. He didn't always do it the right way, but he understood it. And it's something I don't think DA understands, and that's the comment that I don't like. And when I hear Mike going off, I'm like, oh, he's just inserting names and doing this. And, you know, it's that's what he's talking about. Because when you hear yourself talked about by your head coach, you're, you're going to feel a certain type of way about it. And if I'm Taysom Hill and I heard him say that, how would I feel about that? Would I feel like this is a guy who supports me? No. You feel like this is a guy who's making a sales pitch. Yeah, it sounds like he's just waiting for that phone to ring. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's my rant. And I really, I, I don't know. Like, I'd like to see DA improve at this. I really would. Because, you know, I get it. Like, people are people don't like him. I still want to watch a good team. I still want to watch a team win. Right? I'd love to see a playoff game. Because if they fire DA and start over, it's gonna re- that cycle is gonna reset. And I don't think I've seen a playoff game for a while, even even if the new coach comes in and has success. Um, so anyway, like I, I don't know. I heard that and I was just like, ah. Like every now and then I'll hear I'll hear DA talk, and he'll say something, and I'm just be like, because come on, like yeah, this is a layup answer. Pre- when I were doing our pre-show prep and, you know, talking about what we're going through and everything. And then when you mentioned the Taysom stuff, I was like, wait a minute, what did DA say again? I, I completely 
blanked on it and then hearing it again just now it's like holy crap it's like yeah well so we'll see well uh, i mean like, like well, you should just be like that's our swiss army knife he can go find his own he's an important piece of our team if sean yeah. wants to come get him you know go ahead and try right it's like there's so many ways you can answer that question without undermining the idea that you're supporting your player right and and I don't. It's like I wish I wish the, it's it's the same thing at the end of the season when he went out and apologized to the Falcons, right? Like support your team, support your players. Worry about other people. Worry about people outside the building after your own guys. Don't apologize to Arthur Smith. Support your team and then go talk to your team about what happened. The first thing you do can't be apologizing to people and repairing relationships with people outside of the building. And it's like, especially the Falcons. <laughs> well, it's, that's not a, not a, a one for one example, but it's the same idea. It was like, you're answering that question as if the person you're talking to is Sean. You need to answer that question as if the person you're talking to is Taysom, because that's who's going to hear it. And that's who's going to feel a type of way about it. Anyway, one more thing. And then it's a long segment. But we haven't done this episode in a while. Um, Nick Underhill, uh, and he's always so good about getting this contract information. He tweeted out a list of all of the bonuses earned by players last year. And we talked a lot about Chase Young's bonus structure. Um, but what I don't think a lot, a lot of people might not realize is that there's bonus structures baked into basically every contract. And a lot of it's based on playing time. And so you'll see a guy get signed to a lower end contract. And there's usually a lot of language in there that would be like, okay, we're signing you to be a backup. If you end up as a starter, you're going to make more, right? And so... You know, he he tweeted this whole list. I just I, I'll recommend you go take a look at it because it's interesting. The one that really stands out: Rashid Shahid earned five hundred eighty-four thousand dollars in bonuses. Cha-ching! And and you you look at like okay, who earned the most? Paul Sandy, but okay, but he's on a third-round pick contract. He's yeah. making money at the NFL level. Ike Adam is another guy. He signed for a one-year, one million dollar contract, and he ended up earning five hundred and fifty k in bonuses. So. You know, you you look at the guys who are on these low deals, like Rashid Jaheed earning five hundred eighty thousand dollars. That's <laughs> that's significant. This guy has had a UDFA contract. This man is making basically the minimum amount you can you can make in the NFL, and uh, so he's basically doubling his money with these bonuses. Um, so it's it's kind of cool, and it's just interesting to see. Like Ty Summers earned a two hundred forty thousand dollar bonus. Uh, you know, Adam Prentice two hundred k. Landon Young, 200K. So I want, how did Ty Summers get that bonus? Cause I need that kind of contract deal. He, yeah, he, he probably had a much, much more uh, lucrative bonus structure. I mean, a lot of, a lot of special team snaps, you know, like he was, he was active for a lot of games. And like that's kind of, you know, we talked about Chase Young's bonus structure. Like a lot of times all you have to do is be active and be on the active True, game day right. roster to, to earn this. Uh, you know, it's not always based on snap share, but sometimes it's based on snap share. But for Chase Young, for example, he he might not play a snap in a game. If he's active that game, he gets that bonus. Right. Um, so, you know, sometimes that's the structure. Sometimes it's like, okay, if you play 70% of the snaps, but, you know, stuff like that. Anyway, um, that's it. Anything else you want to hit that we didn't talk about before we move on? Uh, no, talked about everything. I think we mentioned, obviously, the officially going to Irvine for training camp two that was uh, released by the team. Yeah, we talked about that at the top. Okay. Yeah, my brain's mush. God, Steve. I know. We've been doing this this segment for so long, you forgot what we started it with. <laughs> I think that's a, tie, a sign we need to... Uh, Moving on to the next segment. Moving on! All right. This is Inside Black and Gold. Thanks, everyone, for watching, for subscribing. If you're not a subscriber, consider becoming one. You know? That would be cool. Uh, I get, you know, we haven't had an episode in like a week and a half, so I appreciate everyone sticking around. Um, and uh, we got a lot to talk about. So we will be back. We're going to talk about the kicking game, what everyone's been waiting for. All right. Who that? We'll be right back. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. This is going to be the kicking segment. And I would say it's going to be short, but if it's anything like Charlie Smith, we're going to talk for a while because <laughs> We mentioned this at the top. This man's introductory press conference was 27 minutes long. <laughs> like those usually go eight, nine minutes. Um, I, I think it does. It, it says one of two things. It says uh, he likes to talk 
But it also says he has kind of an interesting story. And so that's what I kind of want to get into at the top here is, you know, who is Charlie Smith? What is he doing? Why are the Saints bringing him in? I had to listen to his interview twice, which it's 27 minutes long. So, and part of that is because he has a really thick Irish accent. <laughs> and, and I was like trying to make sure I was characterizing what he said correctly, but I couldn't always, you know, some of these, some of these accents, some of these Gaelic accents are really, really difficult. What's um, funny is like I found I found myself leaning in to the computer to listen and I'm like like that's gonna help me any. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's also a Zoom call, so it's not necessarily the highest quality. So it's like, man. Um, but he's is really affable. He's 22, I believe. Um, he is from Mayor Bridge, Newry, County Down, Northern Ireland. Um, you can tell I'm not very worldly because I, I don't understand how you can be from four different places at once. But you know, we'll we'll move on from that. He's six four, two ten, so he's a big guy. So it's just kind of funny. You you're you're gonna end up with this six four, two hundred and ten big dude played rugby in a kicking competition with Blake Groupie, who is like five seven, one hundred and seventy, soaking wet. It is going to be so weird to watch those two guys compete, and Blake and the five seven guy is probably gonna win. Uh, but yeah, so this is a guy who. He did not kick toward kick a oblong football until you know like 15 months ago. He started training for an international showcase in Ireland, I believe. It might have been in Dublin. I he said I can't recall. I didn't write it down. Uh, that was in August last year. That was the first time he kicked in a competitive environment. Kicked a professional football in a professional football. Kicked a football in <laughs> a competitive environment. Um. And and it's interesting because you look at other sports, right? You look at you look at basketball, right? Who, who na- should, name me the colleges of the top players in the NBA? You can for some of them. You can for the Duke guys, the Kentucky guys. But you know, where did uh, Nikola Jokic go to college, right? Where did you know <laughs> Luka Doncic go to college? How about Giannis Antetokounmpo? You know, t- typically the guys who you struggle to say their names. Uh, it. They didn't, right? There's a pathway for European players, players that did not go through the college system to get to the NBA. It's same, same, same is true for b- the baseball, right? Uh, you know, so you look at tennis, right? The international players dominate tennis. There's a lot of money invested in the tennis programs in America. We just aren't good at it. <laughs> so, but there's a pathway for those people from outside of America that, you know, and it's the USTA is different. That's a bad example, but you understand what I'm saying. In the NFL, that really doesn't exist. You know, like you kind of have to go through the college system to get into the NFL to even be looked at as a player that could play in the NFL. And it's you're missing out. You know, you're, you're losing a lot. That's why the NFL is starting to do all this international stuff. Cam Jordan was in the commercial of the Play Africa or whatever, whatever the program was like. There's a reason they're trying to build that out, because like you're kidding yourself. If you don't think there are athletes outside of the spectrum of the NCAA that can contribute at the NFL level. Uh, look at Brandon Aubrey. Uh, that's the guy Charlie Smith brought up, and it's a great example. He didn't play college uh, football. He played college soccer. And he spent a year kicking for the Birmingham Stallions. And this last year, he was an all-pro kicker. He was nailing them from 60 yards. I think he set a record for like the most 59-plus yard kicks in a single game. So these guys exist. It's just a matter of finding them. And I think the Saints are being very proactive about kind of going outside of their traditional circle and finding guys and that's what you found with this guy he played gaelic football right and I, if you don't know what that is it's kind of like a mix of soccer and rugby right so it's not exactly something that you would look at and be like oh okay like this translates directly but you can kick you can kick you know um and so i know here, you've seen the clip of him like drilling that 63 yarder i've got it here, okay <laughs> let's see so this is actually a clip of the 66 yarder six in the crooked upright. Oh, that is good. That is good from four or five yards. The uprights, he's kicking on a field. The uprights are tilted. That's where he's kicking. You know, so to say he is raw is an understatement. He said that, you know, he he kicked that 60, 63 yarder at the showcase, like that international showcase. And he didn't even know what he was doing. Like <laughs> he said, he, he has that video on his phone. And he looks at it and he's like, the amount that my, my, form has changed since this kick is is crazy he's like he's kicking completely differently than he did at that point but it's just a natural ability to kick a ball right um and so it's 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 neat it's cool to see this guy have a pathway he said that he sent an email to the nfl and about five years ago asking for a way to get like tryouts or or whatever 
he he also said he sent like a, a DM to like NFL UK, the Twitter account or the Instagram account. <laughs> no one responded. And he was like, yeah, in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have expected much out of that. But like that's that's he couldn't figure out how to get even a chance, even to talk to an NFL team to be like, guys, I think I can do this. I think I'm pretty good. You know, um, and you've seen it, you know, you see all these Australian punters, right? You know, you've kind of accepted that the Aussie punter guys are are pretty good. And, you know, you go to the SEC and they're all Australian punters, right? And it's like, how does that happen? Well, a lot of them go through the college ranks. Look at Lou Headley, right? He went to Miami. This is a 30 year old man. He was a <laughs> tattoo artist and a professional scaffolder. He went to Miami to to kick. Right. And obviously, you know, he got an education. But this idea that you have to be a college student to play professional football is kind of silly. Right. It's kind of dumb. I know, um, I know a lot of people with this move, too, were asking, like, what does this mean for groupie? You know, and, and yes, that is interesting. And, and we can segue into that because it plays into the new kickoff rule. Right. Yeah. And so in in a lot of instances if if we were only talking about consistency as a kicker consistency as a field goal kicker i think that this would be a camp leg situation you know blake's blake's going to have the inside track regardless but you're we would you would never have looked at it and said if all we need is the most consistent version of a field goal kicker and someone who can kick it out of the back of the end zone you would never you know you might try to develop this guy over time but you would never go to him as a rookie um what changes that, in my opinion, is the new kickoff rule, which Darren Rizzi was one of the biggest champions of, and it's not a it's not hard to understand why. This is a guy who a you you they, this team prioritizes special teams to begin with. There's a reason their special teamers get get scooped up like immediately whenever they hit the free agent market. Guys like Aesop Winston are getting signed. Like like <laughs> when you are when you are a team that has a track record of producing high quality special teams talent, they get poached, first of all. So that's what the Saints do. They always go and find a returner. You know, when they have one of the top returners, they have an all pro returner in Rashid Shahid. So there is incentive to add returns to the game. I think the number was 20% uh, in terms of kicks that actually got returned. And in most cases, it's like you probably shouldn't have returned that because you end up getting tackled through the 25. One of Blake Groupie's traits that this team talked about, Dennis Allen talked about it several times, is he was so consistent on ball out of the back of the end zone on kickoffs. You eliminated kickoffs from the game. And with the old rule, that was the priority because the odds that you could pin someone inside the 20 were unlikely at best. With the new rule, kicking the ball on the fly into the end zone actually costs you, I think it brings it out to the 30. So... Teams will have an incentive to directionally kick on the kickoffs. And if I had to say something that I'm not sure of in terms of Blake Groupie is, can he do that? He did play soccer. So he, you know, he has a little bit more than just being a, like I kick field goals my entire life. Right. He does. He, I think he probably can directionally kick, but we haven't seen it. So that is something that in this instance, with that now being a priority, because if you kick it short of the end zone, you have a chance to tackle them. You know, I think that you have a you have a potential for, you know, if Blake really struggles at that, and that's something that Charlie does particularly well, why why wouldn't you go with him? Um, and you also saw, like, what did you see Darren, or Darren Rizzi do with the punting situation last year? He went with the guy who he could game plan punt coverages and eliminate returns. So he prioritizes that over distance in the punting game. So if you don't think he's going to have a place, a high value on that in the return game, I think you're wrong. I thought it was interesting too. Did um, Gillick, can he even end up anywhere after le- being let go by the saints? I don't think so. He, he went to, he was in Arizona. Yeah. He oh, kicked he did? Arizona. Okay. Yeah, and he was fine, it, but it, like you just saw the way Darren Rizzi wants his special teams coverage units to right. defend. And, and it didn't look pretty, but it was effective for the Saints. He he did what they wanted him to do. He eliminated returns. Yeah. Um, and I think that with nothing changing in the punt game, you're going to see him back. Uh, now, what I find interesting is, and, and, and I recommend, you know, I, I was stuck at an airport in Richmond, Virginia, the smallest airport I have ever been in. Um they had a UFL game on. It was the Birmingham, not Birmingham, uh, San Antonio Brahmas, which is a chicken, by the way, against like DC, whatever. Uh, John Trey Kirkland is actually on uh, the San Antonio team. 
Okay. Uh, he was with the Saints in the practice squad last year. Um, and so the UFL has that same kickoff rule. It was the rule for the, the NFL has kind of been translated from what the UFL does. So if you want to see how this kind of looks, go watch a UFL game. And what will immediately strike you is like with the setup zone and the elimination of being able to get a running start. Every return you can be like every every return is like either you make a play or they break it. It's not it's no longer going to be he returns it and like maybe he can get out past the 20 and he's like, you know, gets blown up like if you have a top end return guy. You can see immediately like with the with if if a team is not on point with its coverage. I mean, these things can go to the house. You know, you're seeing kick returns out to the 40, no sweat. Um, and so I think personally, I think this is going to be a, you know, here's what Mickey Loomis said when he was asked about it uh, at the owners meetings. And I, I think he, he, he makes some good points uh, and we'll uh, look at it. Like, does that change anything with how you well, build special teams? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I think that's part of the equation here is, is, you know, and we don't have all the answers to that because we haven't seen it. We haven't really seen it in our league yet. So how does that change the makeup of your roster? I, I don't think it's going to be real significant, but it'll be, you know, there'll be some tweaks. Um, and, and look, we support that, uh, that change. I think, you know, we need to do something to get the kickoff back in the game. And, and I think this is, this is a, a, a you know viable solution. Uh, you know we'll see if it gets voted in or not. But but um, I think the kickoff is one of the most exciting plays in our game. And so when you're down to you know only getting twenty percent of the kickoffs return, then you know we need to do something. So Mickey was obviously speaking there prior to the vote, and it has been adopted along with the the banning the hip drop tackle hip drop tackle, which is another thing that's going to be uh, it's going to affect games and people are going to lose their mind um uh but you know i think well i agree with him that you're not going to completely remake your roster based on this i do think that he's underselling like i think it's going to have a big impact on scoring i think teams are going to score a lot more points i think you're going to see a lot more kickoff returns long kickoff returns short fields after kickoffs a lot more kickoff return touchdowns right if you go back like 15 years ago, people were in the league because they returned kicks. I got a guy like Dwayne Harris comes to mind. He was on the Cowboys for a long time. He's not in the NFL if he's not a return man. If if this was five years ago, he's not getting signed because the value of a receiver who doesn't really catch passes is not significant enough to use a roster spot. In this type of kickoff environment, you are going to sign guys. Guys like Devin Hester will exist again. Guys like Ted Ginn will have so much more value because every time you kick the ball to them, you are risking seven. And if you don't, if you want to kick it out of the end zone, the other team starts at the 30, you know how big, like 20 to the 30, 15 yards, it's only a hundred yard field. You know, it's like, it's a big chunk of the field. Um, and I don't think teams are going to just accept, right? Right. So I don't know. I, I think it's going to be, a significant change in how not so much the roster makeup, but the strategy employed. I think you'll see fewer field goals. I think you'll see teams in third and medium who are afraid to kick it to a Rashid Jaheed. Maybe hmm. be more aggressive because you might be trading three for seven. You know, uh, you know, Dan Campbell is the kind of standard bearer of being aggressive on fourth downs. And I think you'll see teams, teams are already airing that way to begin with. And I think you're going to see that get even more significant. So I don't know. I, I think it's going to drastically impact games in a fun way, in a way that's exciting, in a way that I think the Saints, it's not a coincidence that their special teams coach is championing this because right. I think the Saints gain a distinct advantage because of how they already prioritize special teams. Yeah, it definitely helps, obviously, too, having that guy like Rashid Shaheed in the mix who could bust one easily for you. And I thought it was funny. I think it was not very long after the new kickoff rule got approved that the Pittsburgh Steelers go ahead and they sign Corderell Patterson. Hmm. No, <laughs> I'm, I, seriously. I'm glad he's not in Atlanta anymore for sure. It's it's going to be a shift. You're going to see games. Like I remember it was a Super Bowl in uh, 2000, I want to say, Giants-Ravens. The only time I've ever seen back-to-back -back kickoff return touchdowns. Yeah. 
and I remember vividly because <laughs> the Giants were getting boat raced in that game, and I and you turned it on. You know, I I, I had an indoor soccer game. I vividly remember this, and uh, I missed the first half of the Super Bowl. And I get home, and I was like, the first thing I see is Giants. I can't remember who it was, but they were trying to kick off for a touchdown. They're down like twenty, but it's like okay, maybe that jump starts. Maybe a fork. Yeah. All they have to do is not, you know. You get a stop and suddenly it's a different game. Instead, they kick it and immediately <laughs> another kickoff return touchdown on the next kickoff. And I think you're going to start to see stuff like that again. You're going to start to see dynamic playmakers able to impact a game in those big moments in big ways. Like late in a game, you're going to have to make the decision that is give the other team the ball. Like you score a go-ahead field goal, right, uh, with, with a minute left. You're going to have to make the decision to either give that team the ball at the 35 or kick it to a guy who could literally end the game on that play. And so I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to see Rashid Shaheed in that role because Rashid Shaheed, you know, he is a kickoff returner. Like that's one of the reasons he was able to stand out in college was his kickoff return ability. And he's going to be able to use that again. He, he has seven kickoff return touchdowns in like three years at Weber state, four years at Weber state. So I, I'm excited. I think it's going to be fun, and I'm looking forward to to how it how it changes the game. Um, but yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, th- but, that, but that's all the I idea have, of but, getting more returns has to bring more excitement to the game for sure because it's been abysmal. Uh, agreed. But yeah, like if you if you want to understand why I feel this way, go watch any UFL game, anyone, and you'll see immediately the difference of like, man, there's so much space to work with, and these elite athletes are able to navigate so much more easily. And the the, the coverage teams are at huge disadvantage. So it's going to be two things. So we talked about the return guy, but it's also going to be, okay, what teams are really good in kickoff coverage return? Because that's another thing that can, that, that'll be able to impact game. Because if you are kicking off that way, then you also have the ability to pin someone back real deep if they screw it up. So, um, I, I, week, I think like, come week one, it's going to be interesting how many returns we get in the first week. Well, and you're going to see teams come up with strategies in real time. No one, none of these teams have had to do this before. Right. So that's why I do gonna, like too, that Rizzy's like at the, 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 you know, head, the head of this, it almost seems like. So the, the, one of the masterminds behind this is on the Saints, So they should have an advantage. I would bet that Darren has spent weeks of his life. <laughs> thinking about how he's going to do this when he finally gets it over the finish line. And now it's like, yes, <laughs> like, you really, like that man is already kind of intense. I wouldn't be surprised yes. if he like broke a light bulb jumping, doing like a Mario coin jump when the vote <laughs> came in. Uh, but no, I mean, again, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, ex- you can tell by like, I watch one UFL game and I'm like, okay, this is going to oh, be a thing. Lord. This is going to be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all I got. And and yeah, Charlie Smith, uh, I'm excited to see how he operates. I'm excited to see whether that leg is legit when it's a little bit more pressure on the line. Um, but you know, I, I also appreciate what the NFL is doing to kind of bring in these international guys. Um, because they shouldn't have to be sending DMs on Twitter and Instagram to try to get a chance. I guess we'll be keeping an eye on two special teams a little bit more this training camp. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I think, you know, what's probably going to end up happening is Blake Groupie wins that job because Blake Groupie is the more consistent g- kicker and you trust him a little bit more. Um, as long as he shows that he can be that directional kickoff guy, I think he wins that job and you keep Charlie Smith around. I know a lot of people were like, oh, he's got a three-year contract. All UDFE, UDFA contracts are three years. That's just kind of the deal. So don't read too much into like, though they paid him on a three-year contract. Blake Groupie also got a three-year contract. That's how it works. Um, but it does secure the, secure the, his rights there. So they'll be able to, you know, if they see, if if they go through this season and they're like, I think he's going to be a real good kicker. He just needs a year to like learn how to kick at, at, at a football, you know, not a Gaelic football. Um, I think you're going to do that. But like, yeah, one, one of the things you do in Gaelic football is there's a lot more kickoffs. There's a lot more, you know, it goes out of bounds. You kick it. You don't throw it. You kick it. So I think there's a lot more experience in terms of how to manage that. Same way Lou, with the rugby background, was able to do that. So uh, that's that's all I got on the kicking game. We were able to talk for 20 minutes about about the kicking game. So 
No, it's a big change. And like you said, uh, definitely, I think a lot of people are anxious, obviously, to see what it looks like. But I'm excited, too, hearing the fact that it's just going to open up things and encouraging more of these returns. 20% kickoff return rate for last season. That's 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 no terrible. No, and, and like what Mickey said, like the kickoff used to be one of the most exciting parts of the game, and now it's become the most boring part of the game. Uh, let me go like, get something from the fridge, right? Yeah, if broadcast just decided to skip the kickoff and come back on the first play of the next drive, Nobody won't care, right? maybe once a season you'd be like, wait, how did they score? <laughs> Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, but I, it's going to be something we I bet we see a lot of in training camp. Like you, you've, in a lot of instances in training camp, they'll start working on kickoffs and return and everyone will go get a drink of water and get out of the sun. I think it's going to be a lot more interesting this year in terms of how yeah, they because uh, right. they're going to have to drill that, you know, like they're going to have to learn how to do that on both sides of the ball. Um, so I, I think that's going to be something that you see a lot of uh, in camp. No, and it'll be in uh, sunny California. And it'll be in sunny Irvine, California. So no one here will uh, get to watch it until real time. But anyway, all right, let's wrap up that thing. We're going to come back. We're going to real quick kind of go into, okay, what are the things that Saints have left to do? They've checked a lot of boxes. There are some several boxes, some very big boxes. There's a lot left of boxes. To check. <laughs> so we'll get into that. This is Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. Subscribe. We'll be right back. All right, back here on Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. This segment, we're going to kind of alternate and probably go through four or five of the top things we think the Saints still need to address. We have pretty much the same list, so we're just going to go off of it. We haven't yeah, really sure. what order this is going to be in, but uh, you'll get the idea. So how about we start with you, Steve? Why don't you, uh, what is your, what is the biggest thing you think the Saints need to look at? I think a number one, you would agree. I would agree. I think fans agree. Probably the Saints agree is offensive line's got to be the biggest concern going into the season just because of uh, the situation you're in with some injuries, uh, the fact that we saw the unit struggled a year ago. You're waiting for some uh, top talent to come through and a guy like a Trevor Penning who is – Hasn't done much, for, if anything, for you. And just an overall uh, cohesiveness to that unit is needed to protect Derek Carr because we saw him get, you know, walloped way too much last season and give him credit, obviously, for playing. But I know the dude wasn't healthy last year and probably was a lot of his problems going uh, for most of the season until the end of the year. It definitely affected him. No, and and – and the problem is not only do you have questions on the offensive line, you have bigger questions than you did a year before, <laughs> yeah. right? It felt like last year going in, you had some answers. Ryan Ramchek was reasonably healthy. You were like Trevor Penning. He's, he's going to be your starter. He's going to get better over time. And uh, you ended up with Andres Pete playing better than I think anyone expected. He's but, still not signed. And anywhere. he's still unsigned, right? And so I think he's a guy who you look at um, and say, kind of break glass in case of emergency. The Saints, because they <laughs> structured Chase Young's contract the way they did, they still have some money to throw around. So you could potentially go after Andres Pete. But I do think the tackles, specifically the tackles, you know, you have some questions at guard, but I, I think this team is hopeful that Nick Saldaveri can be a, a, a player this year. Um, he was always a redshirt guy. So he's a guy that I think no one really knows what to expect from, but I do think there's going to be some expectation there that, he takes a step forward with his new coaching staff and, and goes from there. But yeah, Trevor Penning, I don't know. Right. I don't know. And if you don't feel like you were getting starting caliber left tackle play out of Trevor Penning, that's a problem. Because uh, you saw what, I mean, Derek Carr, I think, did a pretty good job throughout the course of the season of avoiding sacks. You know, sometimes he would hold on to the ball too long and it would take a sack. But you look at the total overall sack numbers for the Saints, and they were pretty low, relatively speaking. They were not... In the top half of the NFL, they were early in the season. I think he had 11 sacks through three games, something like that. And I think they ended up in the 30s. And I think a lot of that was Derek helping his offensive line and getting the ball out. And, you know, so he deserves some credit for that. But it's not good for your offense if the quarterback is having to make decisions based on, I'm going to get blown up if I don't get the ball out right now. You know, and, and, and that's one of the biggest factors in any game. And I think Dennis Allen said this is, affecting the quarterback in 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 some way whether that is affecting him by giving him more time or whether that that is you on defense affecting him by taking his time away 
whichever team does that the best on both sides of the ball, a lot of times you're going to win that game. So I agree. Um, figuring out tackle, also, getting uh, getting a planet tackle is, and is not, not just one. even the passing game. I, I, it might have been the, one of the worst years that I can remember. The Saints' run unit has been as a whole. Just anytime it seemed you handed the ball off, you were lucky to get three, four yards, and that that was it. Right. It'd be nice if you like. You don't have to necessarily excel at both run blocking and pass blocking. <laughs> It'd be nice if you did. But you do have to be good at one. <laughs> like, I do need you to be a good unit at one of those two things. And I don't think they were they could say that about either. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of changes with the offense and how the blocking schemes work at all. So maybe that helps. Um, uh, there should be a little bit more deception in this offense and that helps the offensive line. It slows down the defense and that oh, any, any, any split second you gain through scheme um, helps the helps the player in a one-on-one matchup. So, you know, we'll, we'll see, but yeah, that's the one. There's a lot of things the Saints have done this off season. One thing they have not done in any tangible way is address the offensive tackle situation. So again, we talked about this, like, you know what's going to annoy people is when the Saints draft an t- offensive tackle at 14 and 45. I, 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 th- I think that might be how you do it. Um, but all right, let's move forward. You know, there's a, there's a few things. There's a few things that you could that you could work on. I think you need one more veteran body in the wide receiver room. I don't think it's necessarily a top priority because I think kind of like with Jarvis Landry a couple of years ago, you can wait this out and and find someone who's like, hey, I just want to get a one year prove it deal, and we'll see what happens. Like you did with Jarvis, everyone was clamoring for the Saints to sign Jarvis all off season. They waited and ended up getting him on a very team friendly deal. And so I think that's what you do. But one way or another, I do think you need to add a body in that room because right now your only real veteran receiver who's expected to make an impact as a receiver is Cedric Wilson. Uh, and I don't think that's going to be enough. I want to, I want to see some older guys, some guys who have been there, some good team leader type guys, one or more that you bring in to uh, just kind of, I don't know, be the, be the adult in, the, in that room. Right. Um, and so a guy like Hunter Renfro, obviously is still out there. I uh, would not be surprised if he's a guy who you, again, you look at and you say, Hey, we're going to see what happens maybe later in this off season, you bring them in, but that's always something that happens. It's like you get through the draft teams, figure out what their needs are. And these veteran guys suddenly we get start getting looked at. And so I think that's probably on my list. Yeah, I would agree with you too, especially you just need that big possession type um, receiver. And I know a lot of folks are hoping to see more from AT Perry going into this year. Uh, but I, I want someone to go along with that uh, just because, you know, I, I want a proven big body receiver. I don't know even who might be available still on the market. You mentioned a Jarvis Landry. I know he was clamoring on Twitter recently that, you know, he could still make an NFL team today and that he should have a shot somewhere, which is interesting to me. I, I just don't think that the Saints will be would be bringing him back, though. Yeah, he's not thrilled with his lack of uh, prospects. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, no, and I think, you know, I think if you really want a big bodied receiver, I think you probably go draft a guy. I think I look at it, I'm, I'm of two minds about it, which is like, yeah, you probably do want a bigger bodied guy, but those guys are tough to find in free agency, right? Like, it's not right. like there's these really talented, big bodied wide receivers that are just hanging around, unless your name is Mike Thomas. Um, <laughs> So I, I think those two, those are two different things. Like I want to see a veteran in that room because they're, I think just like the safety group last year, like I love the idea of bringing in Jonathan Abram because I want a veteran guy who can help younger guys. Right. And he did his, one of his main roles in that defensive meeting room was being a leader, you know, and even when he wasn't playing, he was having that impact. And, and that's the type of thing I think you need with the wide receiver, but I would love to see them go out and get, you know, Xavier Leggett. He was my pick in the mock draft for exactly that reason. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's not going to add that veteran presence you want, but uh, to me, yeah, I, I do want that big body possession type guy. You got speed with uh, Olave and Shahid. I agree. <laughs> um, all right, move on. Uh, what's what is the the next on the list? Number three top priorities left to address for the Saints. What you got? Well, I don't know if it's a priority, but to me, like uh, there was all this talk about. 
should or shouldn't the Saints trade away Marshawn Lattimore? I know they restructured his contract uh, to make things a little bit easier to facilitate that, I guess. But man, oh man, to me, after seeing the Tennessee Titans just give away, uh, get get Legereus Need for, what was it, a third round pick and a swap of seventh rounders, there is no way in heck I am giving up Marshawn Lattimore for that little of a return. I don't care if he's disgruntled or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you in that sense of like, so So there's two things. So there's two ways to look at this. One is like, okay, would you trade Marshawn Latimer for a fourth round pick and a swap of seventh rounders? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. And I don't think you're going to give him away for nothing. Like I said in an earlier episode, going into this offseason, one of my top priorities for the Saints was making sure that you don't have to trade Marshawn Latimer, right? You mend those fences however you can. Right. And then... Because the only way you're going to get a reasonable return for Marshawn is if you're willing to wait it out. And that's why I don't like, and so I agree and I don't agree in the sense that I don't, I think people are overreacting to what the Chiefs got for Legereus need in terms of whether the Saints will sign Marshawn Latimer because they're like, well, that's the market for a star wide receiver in the NFL. It's a different situation. And in in large part because whoever traded for Legereus need was going to be on the hook with a major contract they have to shell out. Right. And that's going to limit the 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 market regardless, particularly early on in the process and particularly in a situation where the other teams know that that is an that 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 situation between Sneed and the Chiefs was pretty much irreconcilable. Like you were not they were not going to give him that contract. Other teams knew that. So they're like, hey, you want to get something? Take it. And that's what happened. Now, with Marshawn. Again, the important thing for the Saints is keeping themselves out of a situation like they were in CJ Gardner Johnson, where you got to the end of training camp and you're like, well, no one bit. So now we have to just take whatever we can get. Um, if you can avoid that and just figure it out, then I think, yeah, some team might get desperate and be like, okay, fine, we'll pay. What do you want for them? And I don't think the I don't think the gap is that wide either. Like we we're talking earlier, I think you're looking at like a third round pick with a playtime incentive. To you know, with a playtime caveat that if he plays this number percentage of snaps, it's a second round pick, and then maybe a future pick. And you're talking about 2025, not 2024. So, like, I don't think that gap is that wide that you couldn't get there. But you have to be willing to play hardball and say no. Like, we're gonna keep him. Like, he's a star player, and we want him. If you want him, you're gonna have to come get him. Now, the biggest reason I think a team would be more willing to pay a steeper trade price for Marshawn is the contract situation. Whereas Snead, you had to give him a major contract immediately to even bother trading for him. Marshawn's going to be under team control for two more seasons. So, and and at a reasonable number, because that contract was signed two full seasons ago. And every year you see these markets get reset and reset and reset. You're talking about a guy who's going to be like a $16 million cap number and be your CB1. That's reasonable. Especially if you're a team that, wants to play aggressive man-to-man defense and doesn't think you have the personnel to do it. So, like, I, I, I agree, again, with the idea that you can't take a fourth-round pick from Marshawn and be like, okay, fine, we got it. But I also don't think that the, the trade value for Snead is necessarily going to be like, oh, they're not trading him now. Um, the difficulty is, like, how do you mend those fences while also not guaranteeing to this guy you're not trading him? That's that's the real the real hurdle. And that's when I when I complain about like, does DA understand how to manage personalities in a locker room? Can he get that out of people? Can he create that environment where people aren't sniping and and doing all this and being disgruntled? That's my question. And if you can't do that, then then I think he does get traded and you are going to get a crappy return. See, to, to me, it's like, do do we know, like, if Marshawn truly is unhappy or is this just like whispers through the rumor mill kind of thing because to me obviously Marshawn hasn't popped off on social media or anywhere yeah we talked about this before coming on one thing that is a benefit to the Saints in the Marshawn Lattimore situation is he hasn't gone scorched earth publicly (laughs) so you you could potentially go you go behind the scenes and and be like okay can we just hash this out can we get this to work you know, whereas like Mike Thomas nuked the situation like that. <laughs> you knew, right. That will not be livable again for, you know, until your grandchildren are here. Like it's, 
he went scorched earth and it's yeah, and the houses are all it's gone. There's no bridges to walk across. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case with Marshawn, at least not publicly. So hopefully they can, right. hopefully they can, uh, navigate that. Um, but yeah. And, and, you know, the, that kind of leads me into my last point, which is, you know, the, the next priority is going to be who's your nickel corner. Cause if you don't trade Marshawn, <laughs> then I think it's probably a Lante again, and you're going to have to figure that out. Um, I don't, I, and, and that's why I kind of was erring on the side of like, Hey, this might trade probably makes sense because I don't want to stick Alante Taylor back at the nickel. It did not, I don't think that it's his best position. I don't think he particularly likes it. Um, and I don't think, and I think you could do better in terms of having a dedicated nickel corner and having Alante on the outside. So that's th- those two things are kind of one, a one B or three, a three B, I guess. Um, in terms of if you trade Marshawn, then you do need to go find a dedicated nickel corner. If you don't trade Marshawn, then I think you're kind of looking at the same run it back from last year. No, I, I agree there because yeah, there, there doesn't seem to be that path to for Alante to get to being, you know, CB one or CB two. Obviously, when you have Lattimore and Adebo. Nope, I agree. Uh, Agreed. I, I, I don't know what to to, to make with with. Um, Alante Taylor, obviously, I think he's immensely talented, though, too. I'm just not – I'm not pushing Marshawn Lattimore out the door because I'm trying to make room for for Alante Taylor kind of thing. I don't, Yeah, I mean, that's the tough question, right? It's, it, it's, it, I do think the Saints made it – had incentive to make it a financial situation where they could move on from Marshawn. And they had to do that early, and they did it. So now – does that mean you have created a scenario where you have to trade Marshawn? I don't know. That's going to be up to Marshawn. Um, and we'll find out. We'll have to get him on the podcast to talk about it. Well, it's like, you're like, well, is he really disgruntled? I don't know. <laughs> the only, there's only one person who could answer that question satisfactorily. And he hasn't talked to the media since last training camp. So maybe we'll talk oh, to right. him at training camp this year. It just seems to be like one of those things that was festering or building. And I just... I don't recall hearing anything from Marshawn on that aspect or any of the players either saying that, oh, you know, Lattimore's unhappy here. But it seems to be a general given at this point and why the Saints are considering, tr- you know, moving on from him. Yeah, no, I agree. But uh, let's wrap that point up. Is there anything else you want to hit? Uh, uh, well, safety position, uh, you mentioned – and is Howden going to be that guy, or do you, do you go somewhere else there uh, with Marcus May now out the mix? Yeah, so I, I kind of classify that as like roster battles, right? Yeah. Because um, I don't think, you know, when you talk about, okay, what do they have left to address? I think they've addressed it in the way they're going to address it. They could theoretically go out and get Justin Simmons. Maybe he's a guy who late in the year or late in the off season, his market hasn't developed the way he wanted and he take right. a sweetheart deal. And suddenly you really upgrade at the, at the safety spot next to Tyron Matthew. But to me, I think you've done what you're going to do. Um, and it's really just a question of who wins that job. And so I think you're going to see guys like Jonathan Abram, Jordan Howden, you know, maybe some other names compete for that job. You know, last year we talked about how the CB two job was an open competition at camp. Then you saw Lonte Taylor and Paulson Adebo squaring off. I think that's what you're going to have with the safety position next to Tyron Matthew. Um, but I don't think it's like in the sense of like, oh, they have to go do something right now. I don't see that as being the position, right? And I feel the same way about linebacker. Like I think they the Saints brought in Willie Gay to compete with Pete, right? <laughs> and we're going to see how that happens. Like it's not outside the realm of possibility that Willie Gay is your week one starter because he just outplays Pete in camp. And that's just like, I think last year linebacker was not a position battle this year. I think it is. So that's a, I think that's for another episode of like, okay, what are those position battles? But I agree. Like one of my biggest questions is who's going to play next to Tyron. Yeah. And just when you mentioned, obviously the safety market, just the, a weird year for that. It, it just seems to be that, you know, last year was running backs weren't getting paid. This year they got paid. Now it's like, oh, we're going to toss safeties down the, the the chow line here in the NFL. It doesn't seem to be a much market for them. 
Yeah, maybe that works to the Saints' benefit. Maybe they end up right, benefiting so, from the right. fact that no one wants to play safeties and no one wants to pay safeties, and they're able to bring in Justin Simmons, like a guy like Justin Simmons, I on a it. on a on a on a sweetheart deal. Um, but who knows? We'll see. Either way, uh, I, I think we've hit it. I think we've done it. I think we've done it. I think we've got the podcast. We're back. We're back. We're back, baby. <laughs> um, but all right. This is Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. Again, thanks everyone for putting up with my disappearance over the last last month. Uh, really, I should thank Steve and uh, everyone else at WWL for picking up slack. Um, no worries, cause, man. Cause I have been useless. I have been out of the out of the uh, space. Life life happens, and sometimes life is more important than work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but it yeah. does make coming back to work. Like, like starting work again is is the tough part. It's like getting back into the getting back into the rhythm of things. Uh, I've been sleeping on a couch for like the better part of a month. So getting oh. back into an actual human bed was was nice. That's been I've been like uh, w- one of the things that I've enjoyed the most has been going to sleep at like eight thirty the last couple of days. <laughs> uh, I got these bags under my eyes. You can see I haven't. Been, I get to sleep. But anyway, that's uh that's it. We'll be back later in the week with another episode. I think we're gonna do another mock draft. Um, catch back up on you know what's changed uh since the last one we did, which was about two weeks ago. So this would be number three. So stay tuned for that. And as always, if you have any stuff you want to hear, hit me up on Twitter at Jeff underscore Noah. You can hit up the show at Saints underscore pod, Steve at Steve Geller WWL. Check out WWL.com for the latest Saints news notes and analysis and obviously sports talk with steve uh monday through friday even though it's like only an hour and a half long when lsu baseball is playing unreal and uh also you know cranking up just started this week on sports talk mike detillier missed the draft he's been previewing he's got his inside the draft 520 every day on sports talk so make sure you catch that for sure do it do it thanks for listening peace who that